afternoon. Thank you all for joining us in the, new, in the release of our new report in the next phase, the shale oil revolution, storing CO2 with shale EOR. I'm Michelle Littlefield, program coordinator with the U.S. Consensus Program, and just a little bit about our program. Uh, formerly named Building Consensus on Carbon Capture, Utilization, and Storage, or CCUS, and Clean Coal Technologies. We call this Consensus for short. Uh, this is a cooperative agreement with the Department of Energy, Fossil Energy. Uh, the program educates the public, policymakers, industry, and stakeholders on CCUS and Clean Coal Technologies by hosting webinars like these, along with a series of monthly educational briefings, conference workshops, technical reports, and we also have a monthly news clip of CCUS and clean cold related updates. Uh, if you would like to join our mailing list, if you have not done so already, feel free to send an email to the address at the bottom of the screen and we will add you as a subscriber. So today we are honored to have uh, Vilo Kustran, President of Advanced Resources International and Brett Mary, Project Manager with ARI. They're going to review their findings on increasing shale oil recovery and CO2 storage with cyclic CO2 enhanced oil recovery. If you would like to read along with the report, you can find it on our website, uscaorg slash events. Click on the event page and the download link will be on the right panel. If you have any questions throughout the webinar, please feel free to submit them in the chat box and we will answer them at the end of the presentation. Once again, thank you all for joining. And with that, I would like to introduce our moderator, Mr. Mike Moore. Hello, everybody. And uh, I went down the list of attendees and I, I see a few of you that I, I've known well. and I know a few of you know Vela and his team very well as well. And uh, thank you for taking the time today. I think you'll find this pretty insightful. Uh, for some of you, it's not a surprise that this kind of work is being becoming a little bit more public. But it's been going on for a while, varying results, varying locations. But we, uh, we figure out we take a look at it to the next step not just the use of CO2 for the EOR uh, in shale, but also the potential for sh uh, storage. And it, 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 you kind of got to get your head around it a little bit if it's not an area you're familiar with. And, uh, and then you want to throw a little 45Q on top of it just to shake it up a little bit. So you have, a, you have a different reason, you have a different reason to take a look at some of these resources. And I'm going to turn this over to Bella here in a second. But one of the things to keep in mind at the end of the day is that a lot of a lot of areas that might have been considered off the table is likely places for either industry to be situated or stories to take place it might not only be on the table in the U.S. but other parts of the world as well. With that, I'm going to let Vela tell the story since this is his work and his story, not mine. And uh, Vela. Brett, everybody at ARI, thank you all very, very much for getting this, the, this, the study put together and done and taking the time to tell us about it today. And with that, it's yours. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, Michelle. Um, you may find it surprising that we're already talking about the next phase of the shale oil revolution. Just seems like it arrived uh, not so long ago. Uh, but I hopefully at the end of this presentation, you'll see that it's, it is timely to start thinking about preparing it and particularly with the additional incentive of storing CO2 with shale EOR. Next slide. Well, the first stage of the shale revolution was quite impressive. From below a million barrels a day a decade ago, shale, tight oil, uh, production uh, exceeded 8 billion barrels a day last year and provided two-thirds of total domestic production. The main part of it has come from four basins, the Bakken, Eagleford, and the Permian's Midland, and the Permian's Delaware Basin. You can see that uh, spectacular growth on the chart uh, with the key basins representing the top part of the wedge. Next slide. Uh, so we know a, a fair amount about phase one uh, production, but there's a lot less we know about other key parts of it, particularly uh, information that would allow us to pre prepare for the second phase. And these are questions such as how large is the resource, how much can we recover with the practices we use today, and then moving really in preparation for the second phase, how much would uh, 
shale EOR, injecting CO2, improve recovery efficiency, and how much CO2 can we store here? And we're going to try to answer these in the next 30 minutes or so. And then I'm going to turn it over to Brett, who really headed our resource assessment portion of the study. Great. Hello, everybody. So, yeah, the first step in this study was establishing the size of the shale oil resource in place. Um, so, to undertake this task, you know, ARI, we broke the resource into 51 partition areas in the four major shale oil basins, including the Bakken Shale, Eagleford Shale, the Midland Wolf Camp Shale, and the Delaware Wolf Camp Shale. Our partitions were based on maps of depth, gross shale intervals, productive areas. Uh, in addition, we provided detailed log-based assessments of net pay, porosity, um, oil and water saturations by lithology, uh, and calibrated this to core. There was also, we compiled other key reservoir properties such as pressure, temperature, gas oil ratios, oil gravity, among others. Um, and I'd also just like to note the fantastic work that um, ARI senior geologist Robin Petruzak did on this study. She handled much of the log analysis that was used to guide our resource assessment. So the application of this study methodology to the Midland Basin. Um, here we're going to take a detailed look at Midland County within the, mid, within the greater Midland Basin. It's at a depth of roughly 9,500 feet and covers a wrist area of 820 square miles. Uh, based on our assessment, we found, um, in addition to, you know, partitioning the resource geographically um, by county, we also divided uh, or partitioned the resource into the Wolf Camp A and B benches. And if you can see below the log here of the Midland Wolf Camp, um, we assigned net pay values for each of the, I guess, specific units of the, this would be the Midland Wolf Camp A bench. So it'd be a net pay, porosity, and oil saturations assigned to each of these. So, you know, ultimately we just wanted to highlight that, you know, we provided some really fine grained detailed analysis in this work and you can always revert back to the study um, for more details. So moving on. So now we step into the Bakken Shale resource. Um, we partitioned it into three three you know, geographic areas, the Basin Center in North Dakota, the Margin Area in North Dakota, and a Montana area. And then each of these were broken into counties. So the size of the Bakken Shale um, resource in place was right around 91 billion barrels, with the large majority of this, the bulk of the resource occurring in the Basin Center area within Williams, Montreal, McKenzie, and Dunn County, counties. Um, and just like to note that additional resources exist in the underlying Three Forks Shale, which were not included in this study. Now we move on to the Eagleford Shale resource. Um, we partitioned the lower Eagleford Shale into eastern, central, and western areas. And we then further divided these into condensate, volatile oil, and light oil areas. Uh, volumetric and other reservoir properties were assembled for each of the nine assessment areas in the Eagleford. And we estimate that the size of the lower Eagleford Shale resource in place is right around 139 billion barrels. Um, and again, the upper Eagleford Shale was not included in this resource estimate. Moving on to the Midland Basin Wolf Camp Shale, um, we broke this this the Midland Wolf Camp into three um, geographic areas, the Deep Western Basin, the Eastern Basin Extension, and the Southern Basin Extension. Um, again, so here, and in addition, so here we included the A and B benches in our assessment. So additional tidal resources exist in Lower Wolf Camp benches, often known as the Klein Shale, as well as the Sprayberry Tight Sands. Um, here in the Midland Wolf Camp, we would, you know, with, we estimate that the resource in place is just over 500 billion barrels, with um, a greater concentration of this resource being located in the Wolf Camp B bench. Moving on to the Delaware Basin Wolf Camp Shale resource, 
We partitioned this into four geographic areas, East Delaware, Texas area, South Delaware, Texas area, West Delaware, Texas area, and New Mexico, Delaware area. Um, we assembled data for each of these 18 assessment areas, and we came to a resource in place of 576 billion barrels of oil within the A and B benches. I'd like to note that there are additional tidal resources exist in the lower Wolf Camp benches, um, often known as C and D, as well as in the Bone Spring tight sand, as well as the Avalon Shale. So to summarize this, um, shale oil resource in the four main shale oil basins extends over an area of 29,000 square miles, and it is massive. Um, estimated at nearly 1,300 billion barrels of oil in place, um, this starts to give you a sense of how substantial the resource um, we have in these four major basins. Thank you, Brett. I'm going to now address a question. It's obviously a massive resource. How much is recoverable? Um, and uh, I'll talk a little about the approach we used uh, for each of these uh, assessment units and benches, we developed a pipe well, uh, which would represent the primary or what we call pressure depletion recovery. Uh, then we did a compositional reservoir modeling to calibrate uh, the type wells to reservoir properties, and then uh, developed recovery estimates and profiles for both oil and water production for each of these areas. Next slide. Um, I'm, we're going to continue to use this study area in the Midland Basin uh, in Midland County uh, and in this case focusing in on Bench B to illust further illustrate our approach here and you can see the reservoir properties uh, it's developed with a 9,000 foot horizontal well uh, there is porosity in the matrix as well a little in the fractures uh, and we have the rest of the reservoir properties uh, laid out on this table. This particular 180 acre area contains 7.6 million barrels of original oil in place and about a MCF of gas per barrel of oil. Next. Uh, these are the uh, oil and water type wells for this study area. Um, 30-year recoveries around 430,000 barrels of oil and a little bit less than a barrel of water per barrel of oil. Next slide. Uh, and it's the more difficult part was then also to calibrate the completion practices, uh, which would tie into the production values and the reservoir properties. Uh, we used both information in the literature and operator practices uh, and what we and, and then history matching to define this. So if you're looking at uh, at the top left there, you're looking basically down on this uh, piece of the of the pattern area. There's a horizontal well. There's a stimulated reservoir volume, SRV, that surrounds the horizontal uh, well where the hydraulic fracture has taken place. And then there's the non-stimulated area beyond that. Uh, we have six wells for two sections. And what you see is that the uh, it, within the stimulated reservoir volume, the permeability is almost three orders of magnitude higher than it is in the unstimulated matrix. Next. Um, and so then applying this methodology to each of the units, uh, you see that you saw uh, Brett's presentation of resource in place, 91 billion barrels for the Williston Bakken, and we estimate we would recover with primary practices about 10 billion barrel. It's about 11% of the oil in place. A little less in terms of percent from the South Texas Eagle for Shale, but still a very respectable 9%. And then when you move into the Permian Basin, 
both into the Midland and the Delaware, which is a much more challenging setting because of the uh, stacked lithologies, also uh, considerable water production. Uh, there's also substantial gas uh, associated here. You're getting recovery efficiencies of five to six percent with primary practices. But even with these lower recoveries, you get approximately 85 billion barrels of technically recoverable shale oil resources using the practices we use today. Next slide. So then let's move on to what we want to talk about in this next phase. How much more can we recover if we start using CO2 EOR and how much CO2 can we store here? We, we took the same reservoir properties from the history matching for the study areas. We put those into the GEM compositional reservoir model uh, to model cyclic injection of high pressure CO2 and then estimated, whoops, estimated volumes of oil recovery storage of CO2 and then extrapolated the results to each partition in each basin. Thank you. Next. Um, we also want to take a look at what is industry doing. And those who have tried to follow this, you know that because this is a new emerging technology, companies are looking to develop certain proprietary uh, technology here, it's held quite closely. EOG has put out some information. They're the, at this point, the largest practitioner. Um, they've done over 150 cyclic gas injections, mostly using natural gas. Um, and they recover, they report in their, uh, probably their longest running 32 well cyclic project, they would get at about 30% to 70% to primary recovery. And we call that an uplift of 1.3 to 1.7x. I'll be using that terminology uh, going forward. Next. We also wanted to look at some additional information available in the literature. There are three EOR projects, the Hank House, Mitchell, and the Baker de Forest, really uh, cited pretty much next to each other in the Eagleford Shale. And what these are, they add up to basically 25 wells here. Uh, and you see in the um, chart really on your left, it, as the uh, various projects came on, uh, when they all reached their peak, they provided about 5,000 barrels a day. They declined and uh, the last year of reporting in 2018, had declined to around 1,600 barrels a day. Uh, next, uh, but we also wanted to do our own work. Um, and this is work actually, I, I use the term we, but it's really Brett who did this. He went back into the Texas Railroad Commission database and pulled out the Martindale unit. And it's nice in that the wells cover the whole unit. Um, and uh, what you can see on the left is in that the first decline would be the primary production. It had produced about three years. And then you begin to see the, the response in terms of oil recovery to the about seven sequences of cyclic uh, gas injection. And if you look at the uh, uh, information on the right, you see it, it provided an uplift of about 36%, well within the range of what uh, EOG had reported. And clearly, if this had continued on for additional cycles, uh, that number would be higher. Next. Our approach here, as I mentioned earlier, we, we uh, put the detailed pathology and the reservoir properties into the GEM model over 7,000 grid blocks to really calculate this three-phase multi-component flow that would take place in the shale reservoir in response to CO2 injection. Next. And here's what we saw. And this is again coming back to the Midland County study area. You see in green that initial decline of primary production, about five years, and it was getting towards its economic life, uh, had recovered about two thirds of an EOR when uh, we started uh, in the model 
injecting CO2. And in cycle one, we injected at 17 million cubic feet a day for two months. And you can see that in the, in the red spikes on the chart. Uh, also, there's some variation because we limited the bottom hole pressure to 4,800 PSI. The injection was followed by two weeks of soak and then six months of production. And you can see the production in the green spikes. You can see it, you know, a quick spike and then a decline. And you'll see as the cycles went on, slowly the, uh, the re each response uh, becomes somewhat less in terms of production. Overall, 12, a day, 12 cycles in total. Next. And what we found was that, uh, yes, uh, this, the Midland wolf camp shale responded quite nicely to cyclic injection. Uh, if we added up all the oil, we got over 300,000 barrels, about 70% is incremental, 223,000 barrels from shale EOR. And it provided an uplift of uh, 1.63, 63% over primary production. Next, uh, shale EOR uh, performed quite nicely in the other two basins as well. Eagleford provided about the same kind of uplift, uh, 62%, a little less in the Bakken shale, uh, 41%. Next. So when, when you put it all together, uh, our overall uh, incremental oil recovery from these four basins is 40, almost 48 billion barrels. And we were storing around 20 billion metric tons. Most of that, uh, the great bulk, came from the two basins in the Permian, the Midland, Delaware, and they accounted for 36 of the 48 billion barrels and most of the storage. And I think it's important if you take a look at the storage, the 20 billion metric tons and divide by the barrels, roughly 48 billion barrels, you're, you're storing more than a half a metric ton per barrel of CO2 or barrel of oil recovered. And that basically you're putting in more CO2 than uh, is in the oil content than the CO2 content in the oil that's being produced. So you could call this carbon negative uh, CO2 uh, oil recovery. Next slide. Just to summarize, uh, it's a massive resource with what we do today. We get a modest amount, six and a half percent. And by uh, introducing shale EOR, we can add substantial recovery and provide space for storing 20 billion metric tons of CO2. Next slide. So I wanna close with some comments and this takes me back to our stage one and stage two of the shale revolution. Um, the first stage has seen aggressive development. That's behind the, the strong production response. But along with that, uh, we have consumed much of the higher quality portion of these shell basins. Over 10,000 wells drilled in, as you saw Brett describe, in the center heart of the Bakken shale, twice as many wells, 20,000, in the core areas, and particularly the Carnes Trough area of the Eagleford shale. And, thus becoming quite mature. And while the Permian is the more recent of these, uh, think back a year ago when there were nearly 500 wells, rigs working in this basin. And along with that, and, uh, wider well spacing, use of longer laterals, you're starting to consume much of the core area in the Permian basin as well. So with these observations, I think it is timely to start for thinking about developing the technology and then applying some advanced shale EOR technologies, uh, which would help maintain domestic oil production and also give you a new place to store CO2. Next slide. 
I do want to acknowledge the support we have received in the past from the U.S. Department of Energy, NETL, National Energy Technology Laboratory, on uh, work in this area, uh, which allowed us to basically compress that work as well as conduct new work, additional work for the USEA. Thank you very much. Bella, thank you very much, and Brett and your team over there. And I know Joyce is out there also. I don't think this would get done without Joyce riding shotgun on the gang. So thank you also, Joyce. Um, you know, Bella, I've known you for a long time, and uh, I remember being in front of a number of different people back around 2002, 2004, when CO2 EOR was, was the topic, conventional CO2 EOR. And the numbers were big that we were looking at and we were talking to people about, and there was a lot of skepticism that these things played out, it's over the hill. And, and of course, the topic in 2002 when I go out to Midland was, who's closing our offices next? Uh, so now 18 years later, we have some not dissimilar conversations because of the, what's happened with the pandemic and the uncertainties, but we're also walking out into the marketplace with a whole new set of numbers, a whole different approach to going into this, this, these resources-based basins uh, with, with potentials that are, you know, they're almost a little bit too big to get your arms around. But it wasn't that long ago that we were doing the same thing with rise underneath the main pay zone and the same kind of routine again, uh, the shrugs and the wink, wink, nod, nods. And, and of course, come to discover, there are a few companies that kind of figured that out also, just weren't talking about it. And then you've got the Greenfield Roz. It's all premium basin at this time. And it's the same thing once again, you know, the wink, wink, nod, nod. And sure enough, there's a few folks that have kind of gone out there and done it. Key to all of this, of course, is economics. And I'm, I'm, not, I'm not the technical person. And I'm not your guy with the spreadsheets making the numbers work. But I tell you that you got a few more things going on this time around that we didn't really have before. 45Q tax credit is a driver for a lot of interesting opportunities that hadn't really put the shale piece into the equation. Not that, it, not that it's going to make it economic overnight and we're going to see things supersede anything else, but it's opened the door to a whole range of different ways of thinking about the assets that have already been deployed, the, the uh, ESG and CSR pressures that a lot of companies feel, the land resources that are on, in certain, certain states and certain regions suddenly take on a new value proposition, potentially as a, as a CO2 storage area, as well as a, an additional resource recovery area. So if you're a state, it's severance taxes and jobs and uh, all the things that come with it. If you're a landowner, you probably expect more life out of your royalty checks. And if you're, if you're a tribal entity, you can expect potential for more, more wealth coming out of your resource base there as well. This is, this is, this was a, by, I guess the 45Q is the, this is the un, unplanned uh, aha moment that 45Q brings to the table. Of course, it's not a done deal. There's a lot of work in front of us. There's going to be a lot of work that ARI and others will do to prove some of this up. But I also want to throw one other thing out there, and we've got, we'll have some questions coming in is that you were generous on the life cycle of these production wells. Uh, the, the decline curve is fairly aggressive, more likely, more normal than not. And then, but then going cyclic, you actually give another eight to 10 years of life into that resource. Well, that's pretty phenomenal when you think about what that could mean for these regions where this could potentially work. Of course, it applies to all the other areas. We can do resource recovery with CO2 and also do storage. Um, but there's one other thing, and, I, and, I, and I'm gonna go back to you, is unlike when we were working on this in two, early 2000s, where if we went back into a mature field where the wells had been drilled in the 20s and 30s, and some of them we couldn't even find, you know, you couldn't even find until you started injecting CO2 in the ground. Um, failed casings, cement jobs. Well, we go down the list of things that are very mature, old field, presented to CO2 EOR uh, in the new world. We go into shale, all these wells have been permitted under the, under the most rigorous environmental regulations that we've ever had. This is all top in new equipment, new cement, new casings, new technologies, 
and a lot more insight on how all this stuff is working. So the, 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 the knock-on effect is, is that the expense of new regulations has already been borne by the first person in. The expense of uh, resort, the uh, top site infrastructure, flow lines, gathering lines, uh, storage tanks, uh, takeaway capacity, uh, that's all been, that's all installed. And so, and it's all new, new by industry standards, I guess I should say. So just, I, I, I'll stop there. Um, we, we gotten, one of the things I guess I would ask is the quality of the crude that gets produced with CO, with a, with CO2 injection, Vela, is it, is it similar to what's being produced or is it like in some of our conventional EOR, it's a little different quality. Uh, than when you did your initial production? A uh, great technical question, Mike. What we see is that uh, we're injecting CO2 at high pressure uh, and looking for it to become miscible with the oil that's in the shale. And it's a multi-contact type of a process. Uh, and what it does, it begins to extract the lighter components. And so right. if you're dealing with, let's say, a 40 to 45 degree uh, oil, you'll get something that's 45 to 50 or even higher type of returns. You strip the lighter ends first, and then as you continue the contact, you'll begin to uh, basically produce the lower uh, uh, gravity or higher molecular weight components of the oil. Uh, and there, and you know, it it uh, there are ways to maximize either of those depending on how long you soak and and the rates and the pressures and things like that. Uh, we just we have not tried to optimize. What we tried to do was just to use kind of a middle of road current type of a case. Right, and again, the purpose of this uh, study. I've got some questions coming in. The purpose of the study was to come in at the high level and begin to give it some parameters of where we, what, what are gonna be important and what needs to go back in and, and, and gone into deeper detail, more technical analysis and, and uh, site assessments and, and areas like that. Would also add, this is just a selection of, of a number of areas that are out there yet to be, to be looked at from this set of eyes. So some of the questions coming in is, um, this one, do we need new wells for CO2 EOR or current wells can be retrofitted to inject CO2? Um, uh, uh, Mike, you kind of introduced that already. These are newly drilled wells. As you saw, the study area well had been on production for five years. And then we're using the same production well. It's a cyclic approach. It, a lot of people also call it huff and puff. You inject in, let it soak, you produce it uh, back, and you use the existing infrastructure. You do have to, um, you know, bring in the source of the uh, gas injection, the CO2, and put in a, basically a compressor. Uh, but beyond that, the capital investment requirements are actually quite limited. Uh, and uh, uh, then it really comes down to, how well uh, did your process work? Right. Well, that's always kind of the part of the sauce of the, of the, of the spaghetti here that yes. the operator's got its own way of making things work. So i um, got another question. Uh, can you comment on the economic performance of the EOR outcomes? This is from, a, from an old associate of yours. It's Scott. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I should ask him not ask questions. <laughs> um, <laughs> He knows. <laughs> yeah, we, we did not look at the economics yet. Uh, that's something that, you know, we'd like to do as part of a subsequent follow-on study. Uh, there are some numbers out there uh, that industry has put out. I think EOG talked about making, basically, you put all in, you've got about, uh, and, and they didn't say exactly how they valued the injectant, uh, but they basically said around six dollars a barrel of front end costs, and then you then depends on you know how you count your operations, which you have 
continued operations to get the remaining primary and so on. So it's a fairly subtle type of economics. Um, my, you know, you can take a, if you look at the kind of recoveries that we're getting, say 250,000 barrels, uh, multiply that by say $40 a barrel and take off some things, you can see that if it performs well, that uh, this can be quite attractive. Now, I do want to add, and I, I talked about it needs to perform well. It's not going to perform the same in all settings. You need sure. certain uh, favorable geologic conditions. You might want to make sure you've got, you can basically build up the reservoir pressure uh, that you can contact as much of that matrix as possible without channeling into other wells. Uh, and there are other uh, oil composition aspects to this that make things less or more favorable. Uh, so there, there's a lot we still don't know about this. Uh, and this is, and one of my real interests is, and there are a couple of other people like uh, Professor Hoffman up in North Dakota, who are trying to gather this uh, empirical information that uh, is basically uh, being gained by industry, and you really have to struggle to uh, peel it out of the data. <laughs> yep. Well, um, by the way, we, we have a number of questions coming in. We've got enough time. I'm going to try to get to as many of them as, as I can. All right. Uh, the next one coming up is, can you comment on the economic performance of the EOR outcomes? That's that's probably somewhat, well, it's, it's, same, it's Scott again. So working kind oh, of. Let, let me add to that. Remember, I, I think the long term, uh, the next stage of this will be continuous uh, CO2 rather than huff and puff where mm -hmm. you'll just look like a conventional uh, uh, EOR, CO2 EOR project. You're injecting into a well and you're producing from a, not, a separate set of wells. There, you may have to drill wells or maybe your well spacings are just right. They convert one of the producers to an injector. That's been a real challenge so far. I think that's the next big breakthrough to assure that you can contact it, you don't channel through, uh, and how and, and clearly how you set up your field at the beginning in terms of its spacing and stimulation will have a big role as to how right. successful your shale EOR project will be. So we have uh, Grant Brommel uh, is got one for you and, uh, and being very complimentary his question is about the approach being used to uh, for enhanced recovery you were modeling in the last two slides. Would that basically be the equivalent of a huff and puff in conventional resources or some other method? Uh, if it, it's like huff and puff, what is the mechanism for the CO2 that remains in the reservoir at the end? All right. Yeah, it, it's, it's basically exactly like some of the very early attempts to do uh, CO2 huff and puff in the various reservoirs. Uh, the difference is uh, you're going after a reservoir where more than 90% of the oil is still left behind. Uh, and this oil is light. Uh, and so there's a much bigger and a higher quality target to go there. The, the mechanism for storing the CO2 is the CO2 that becomes trapped in the uh, pore space uh, uh, as it displaces the oil as well as uh, any water that gets produced. And then you can also add some additional storage, which wasn't in our numbers, by basically then re-injecting that last amount of produced CO2 and shutting in the well at pressure. And that would be one approach to op further optimizing the storage capacity. We've got another question here. Thank you for that. Uh, from Talal al Shalfut. Did this work, I hope I did that right, did this work consider the possibility of utilizing CO2 as a fracturing agent in the process? Or I added the word process. Although many concerns are discussed in the literature, such as profit, transport, and economical feasibility, injecting CO2 as a fracturing agent demonstrated including complex fractures 
with anticipated much less damage around the well vicinity. In addition to that, considering volume of CO2 is absorbed, which helps storing CO2 as well. So I, I think you kind of get the gist of that. Yeah, uh, the, um, there have been a number of attempts, actually more up in Canada than in the US of using CO2 uh, as part of the fracturing fluid. Sometimes as a front end spear to give you some energy, sometimes as a whole fluid that uh, is injected uh, one of the difficulties, just like using nitrogen, is that it doesn't carry propent as well as water does. But you're absolutely right, uh, the person who asked the question, that it's, it is less damaging. Um, but I, we're looking at uh, multiples, many multiples of volumes of injection in these cycles as we would in what we would use for the hydraulic fracture. Um, the gentleman, Sayed Hosini, who had asked the first couple of questions, um, is asking, how does the performance of CO2 EOR compare to refracking the wells? Which is a pretty good question. Um, yes, it is. I, there's a lot of debate about how successful refracking is. Um, I've been involved with some companies that have tried it, and been quite disappointed in the results. I think it really depends on, and I hate to say this, how poorly you did your job in the first place. And if you did a very small, limited job, use some uh, fluids that created damage, then you've got a target. If, if you did a really good job and, and good size, the target becomes much less. Um, mm -hmm. But it really is, very site specific. I, I want to I make sure I, I answer a question that Michelle sent to me, because that's an important one for some of the audience. All of the CO2 that you produce, it gets re-injected. And the question was how much of that CO2 basically that I call it stored, remains in the reservoir. Basically what we count as stored is what remains in the reservoir. It's essentially equal to what you either in, uh, purchased um, and then re-injected. And uh, I think we've seen enough information from industry who does worry about this, particularly with the topic of 45Q, that the losses are really minimal, well less than 1% in, you know, maybe in certain leakage in the valves or things like that. But basically, all that CO2 does get put back into the reservoir and not emitted to the atmosphere. All right, thank you. Got another one here from William McCartney. And the question is, is there a minimum CO2 concentration needed for effective EOR? Now, when we do conventional EOR, we're pretty much got a, a, the high number, a high percent requirement yeah. because of the, mis the going into its, uh, its phase shift. Um, but here we talk about, we had people that have been trying mixed gas. The, the huff and puff is going to have uh, issues as well with mixes, mixed gases. What, what, what do we need for this? I, I think there's considerable range of mixed gas opportunities here. Clearly the value, the advantage of CO2 is that it has a lower miscibility, minimum miscibility pressure. So you can go into reservoirs and achieve miscibility at lower pressures. Uh, you, if you begin to add uh, methane to it, it does raise the pressure. However, if you add other heavier components, ethanes and the propanes to it, assuming that, you know, you've got a depressed market for these, uh, you can have a variety of, of uh, gases. In, a, in another study, we looked at uh, some of that and we find that in general, CO2 performs better but the others uh, can perform well, and in, in some cases may well be the uh, most economic choice to use. But you won't, of course, get your 45Q for storing the CO2, but only for the portion of the fluid that makes up the CO2. So there's a lot of trade-offs. There's a lot of trade-offs. Um, Steve Melzer was uh, uh, making the comment in the, in the uh, question 
assume all produce CO2 recaptured and re-injected, correct? And I, I think you kind of covered that in that earlier response. Hi, Steve. Thank you for joining. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and um, Moji Karimi um, uh, says, thanks for the great presentation. At what cost of CO2 per ton would the CO2 EOR in your simulations remain economical? Uh, yes, the, the great economic question. Oh, yeah. We're, we're... I'm gonna, I mean, I think when we look at this, we assume that there is a market price for CO2. And the market price, you know, it depends on the oil price, but it will assume that we had roughly $50 oil, which would be nice to get back to or above. Uh, you'd be looking at probably uh, delivered at the field about a, a dollar in MCF, which would be about, uh, what, $19, $20 a metric ton. Uh, lower oil prices, uh, it'd be less. Uh, and, and also the operator could afford to pay less and higher oil prices, it's in the other direction. All right, uh, we got one from uh, Bob Finley. So uh, Bob, his question is, any sense of when in primary production, it would be optimum to begin the cyclic CO2 injection? Right, well, um, we waited for five years in, in the sample. You saw that in the Martindale project, it was three years. You really mm -hmm. want to bring down the pressure in the stimulated reservoir volume area so that then you can basically inject substantial volumes as opposed to, because it is pressure limited, uh, right. what you can inject. And so you'd like to bring the pressure down, uh, you know, maybe to a few uh, thousand PSI, again, depending on the depth of the formation, so that you can get substantial volumes of CO2 into it. And you'd really like to take advantage of the capital that you've spent uh, on to get out of your primary production. Yeah, right. recall if you saw the slide that there is a time period when you have to shut the well in. Part of it is to get it ready for injection, to bring on the rest of the equipment and to inject CO2. So uh, you'd want to do that when your production is, you know, not anywhere near its peak, but really at the lower portion of your decline curve. By the way, not to, so we kind of, kind of, get a little levity in here. Um, and maybe Brett, you can answer this. I've heard stories that people trying to understand what's been going on with the, this next phase of uh, EOR in shale, that we've, we've seen kind of people doing secret agent kind of work, uh, drones flying at night, reverse engineering the equipment layout at particular well pads, uh, watching uh, trucks, come and go, how often they're hauling material out and in, uh, all those kind of things have been going on because a lot of this information has been, has been tight. And of course, the reason it's tight is if it works really well, you don't really, you're not in a big hurry to share it with your neighbor because you want to go lease that land up before, why they think it might have been already past its production curve. Is that, I mean, what kind of things did you have to go through to find the data for all this? Yeah, so, I mean, you know, as, the example we showed for the Martindale lease, to give you an example, you know, that was a three, there were three wells in that lease. Um, and that was great because normally when you're looking at these larger projects, there might be, you know, over 15 wells producing from a single lease area. And that production is all reported to Texas under one lease. Mm -hmm. Now the issue might be only two thirds of those wells are undergoing the cyclic CO2 injection. So then it's a matter of, okay, can you take out the production from the non-CO2 EOR wells or the gas injection wells? Um, so that presents one of the, I guess, most significant challenges. Um, you know, upon further digging um, into the Texas RRC, you know, there are sources of information that can help guide you on kind of you know, addressing exactly what I just described, and they provide really detailed information, um, you know, that in future studies, we could really start looking at the performance of some of these cyclic gas injection, um, you know, pilots, and hopefully we start to see some of these, you know, some CO2 being used as opposed to the wet gas. But, um, it, you know, it's, it's a challenge, but, you know, from what we've seen, you know, if you really dig in, you can, you can find a lot of really great information there. 
right, good. But you weren't. Mike, maybe as a, kind of a follow-on, you could, uh, through USCA or through your sponsors, uh, develop some interest in this kind of thing. Uh, just as a humorous note, one of the uh, people that tries to track this uh, actually used satellite imagery to track where the compressors were sure. uh, to identify projects and then try to go into the data Texas database to try to figure out what was happening. You know, just uh, off the top of my head, if I'm going to go back into a well with a different kind of production and, and, and stimulation process, don't I have to re-permit it? Uh, that's a great question. I think you do because I'll leave it at that. I don't want there is a reporting requirement, right, right. Brent? When you spoke Correct. with the Texas Railroad Commission, there is a uh, reporting requirement and a um, you know you put in for your injection pressures and all of those type of requirements. So yes, there is getting to that information <laughs> of course. is the challenge. And it Perhaps. also depends if the operator is going to cite this production as enhanced oil recovery. Um, if they choose not to do that, then I think the permits become a little bit more lax. Gotcha. A little bit more difficult. Well, to I'm gonna tell you what, we're gonna jump back in on some of the questions we've got. I got a couple more that have popped up. Uh, this is from uh, George Hampton. How much CO2 comes back with the oil? Well, a I, I think if you, if I went back to my uh, slide, uh, yep. you saw that uh, red spike, and then you saw the basically the, um, oil, the the green, and and basically, oh, the large, I, I can't give you the exact number, but uh, most of the injected. CO2 comes back and then you re-inject it and with additional uh, augmentation to it uh, such that, um, yeah. Almost there. One, one, there we go. So you can see the injection of the CO2. I didn't show on here to production, but more or less 80% of what you injected or so in each cycle comes back. Uh, and then more than as you're starting to fill up the, the trapping mechanism. Uh, and it, it is, assuming that we've done this correctly, nicely, it is a mixture. It's a miscible mixture that is coming back with oil and water basically in a single phase until the pressure drops and you begin to get the separation again. All right. And then you, then you separate the CO2, you put it back in, and you continue that process and add to it to make up for what you trap in the reservoir. Gotcha. So I've got, I got another one from Moji Karami, and I got uh, right behind him is Michael Rains and George Guthrie. So you, you, got some, you got some good folks coming in with some interesting questions. So Moji asks, another question in your model, what's the assumption for the percent of CO2 that's not sequestered? So if 0.5 tons of, ton of CO2 is used to product, produce one barrel, which produces about 400 kilograms of CO2 if combusted, that only leaves room for 100 kilogram or 20% non-sequestered CO2 to remain carbon neutral or negative. Uh, okay, let me, you're, you're leaving behind the half a metric ton, okay? Yep. In the, uh, the whole half a metric ton. Uh, and what, in you produce a barrel of oil, and just like you noted, it contains about four tenths. So you're leaving in the reservoir five tenths, and in the oil you produce, there's about four tenths of a metric ton of CO2 when combusted. Now, you know, some of that oil is not combusted, uh, like goes for petrochemicals and things like that. So there, there is a net storage of CO2 beyond the CO2 that comes back in the produced oil. Okay. And, and you, can, you can increase that, you know, if you have incentives for storing. Right. 
it's it, we some of the, the operations are going to have a hand in that as well. Oh yes, oh yes, is, and what his intentions are. Um, there's another person that popped up, uh, uh, James Gervosa. I hope I pronounced your name correct. Uh, and his question is: Are you using waste CO2, and what are some of the common sources? Well. Um, you know, I, I guess you'd view if there, if you had a gas processing plant there by, and that's how EOR started, of course, from yep. West Texas, uh, transported to Sac Rock. Uh, typically, you basically currently vent that byproduct uh, CO2 and keep the methane and the liquids, and uh, that is waste CO2, uh, and that's something that uh, you can compress, transport, and use as your injectant. You know, there's lots of waste CO2 that comes off of power plants, comes off of hydrogen plants, comes off of fertilizer, ammonia, uh, ethanol, and so on. And I like to call it as byproduct instead of waste. But however you call it, it's CO2 that could be used and used productively um, mm -hmm. at relatively modest cost. When you get into capturing it from power plants, then that becomes a, a more challenging task. And, you know, in my view, we need a little more help from the 45Q to fully have a business case in the power sector. But that's another topic for another time. Oh, yeah. We've worked, yes. certainly worked through these. And I've got... This is George Guthrie's question. Uh, first, it's, uh, it says, nice presentation. Uh, you mentioned that CO2 is more effective than other gases. Do you have a sense of the relative impact of repressurization versus the miscibility effect, perhaps by comparing nitrogen and CO2, for example? Um, yeah, I, I, I have not tried to parse out the various mechanisms. There, there's a number here, of course, for CO2, in addition to the miscibility. Uh, prior to that, you would get reductions in viscosity, you'd get swelling of the oil, you do get the repressuring effects. And uh, even with nitrogen, at a high enough pressure, you can get the stripping effects. But I think that's a really interesting topic to examine. Um, I suspect that, you know, um, I still think that the other mechanisms, the miscibility, will far outweigh the repressuring. Gotcha. So I have, I have one from an anonymous attendee. They, they've been patient with their question. What is the average amount of time for CO2 to mineralize in a shale reservoir? Ah, uh, yes. I don't think I'll be around to answer that question. <laughs> yeah. uh, it, it's a slow process and you need the right kinds of basically minerals in there. It's not something that I would count on uh, in terms of storage at this point. There are people looking at this topic of injecting it into basalts uh, and other types of setting, but it's basically a let's just call it a long-term process. Gotcha. Uh, and it would be, and there's been work on that as well. So I, I think we're going to run to the tail end of it. There's, there was one last response from one of our participants. It was Rick Redman. He was saying hi to all of us, you, I, Steve, and the others in, in the community, and looking forward to be reconnected. And Rick, to answer your question in there about the presentation and, and the study, they're both going to be available as well as the recording of this uh, webinar will be available on the USCA website. And um, Michelle, is there anything else that I may have missed with the questions? Because they've come in through the Q and A and through chat and some by private email. So, yeah, looking at uh, the ones that you have answered, I believe you have covered all of them. Uh, if not, if there's one that we are missing, feel free to send an email to uh, myself or Mike, and we'll make sure that it gets answered. All right, great, and stand. St and Dr. Stephen Carpenter says, great job and hello. Thank you, Steve. Um, Thank you, Steve. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do this. I'm going to say to Bella, you, and Brett, and Joyce, uh, for the work that, that your, your team has done to put the study together and for being here today with us to, to walk us through what, what your findings were. And Val and you guys, it's always been a pleasure to run with you. I mean, I, 
Um, I, many times, uh, as we walked into this in the early 2000s, and it was just conventional CO2 EOR, and, and as we progressed through the other factors. The way you like to put it, the prize gets larger, right? Oh, well, yeah, it's always been the size of the prize keeps getting bigger. It's got, <laughs> the, first, the first series was the size of the prize. And, and what was the original? The original numbers were like 28 billion barrels of recoverable oil in the right. basin. And I'd get challenged by people saying, well, you know, Mike, that's just a niche market. And I'd go, well, yeah, I guess some parts of the world it might be a niche, but where I come from in Texas, it's kind of a big market. <laughs> anyway, I get yeah. to belabor it. Michelle, Alex, thanks. And uh, the DOE, the, fossil, the Department of Fossil Energy, thank you for your support as well. And uh, to everybody, thank you very much for taking the time to be with us. And we'll be, we'll be up with some more of these shortly. See yeah. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Hey, everyone. Thank you.